Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high-quality racing oil for your two-stroke or four, make sure you go to Blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. Hey, this is David Iser from DMXS Radio, and you are about to get roosted in the Motocross Vault. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is a look back at the history of Suzuki's open-class motocross machines. Uh, they started in 1971 with the infamous... Uh, TM400 Cyclone, and went through 1985, at least in other markets, uh, with the last RM500. The RM500 went away in, in 1984 here in the U.S., but I thought I'd include it here because a lot of other markets did get an RM that year. The early ones, I have a little less information on. The, the, I was obviously 70, I was born in 69, so I wasn't very old when the TM came out. Those bikes are really infamous for how wicked they were. I've never ridden one myself, but they have quite a reputation. And I've tried to be as thorough as I could uh, with what they changed each year and talk a little bit about the motorcycle, but there's just not a ton of information out there. I have a few tests, and even the brochures I have really don't say a lot about what changes year over year, but I've done the best I could to kind of suss out what they did change and how it impacted the machines. But I'm not the expert in those early 70s bikes by any means. I was really a, a small kid. So if you do have any additional information or if I make a mistake or something, please feel free to leave it in the comment section. Uh, obviously, there are people here older than I was that actually rode those bikes, probably know a little bit more about them. But I've tried to be thorough uh, here as much as I could. So again, if you have any additional information, you want me to make a correction or something, please feel free to leave it in the comment section. I'll try and make an update there as well. Uh, this is going to go by year by year, uh, basically talking about what they changed year in and year out and a little bit about the performance, as I said. Uh, if you like to, this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. I've done a history of the CR250, then a history of like the open class Hondas, the CR500s, uh, several other like year by year uh, video histories like this. I'm going to be doing others in the future for you know Suzuki, Kawasaki, Yamaha, maybe KTM as well if I can get enough information on it. Those KTMs are really sketchy. If, if anybody out there has information on early KTM stuff, I would love to have it because uh, that's really the blind spot. I don't have a lot of stuff on Husqvarna and KTM. They just really weren't as covered in the U.S. magazines as I, they were in other markets. I would love to do more videos based on those, but I just need to get the most information I can to try and put the video together. So if you do have anything, reach out to me. You can the uh, I'll put my email in the comment section below. It's the motocrossvault at gmail.com if you'd like to help me out with that and some other videos in the future. I would certainly appreciate the assistance. If you'd like to support what I do here at the Motocross Vault, I have Motocross Vault merch available. I have a great Suzuki design. I did one based on the history of the RMs with the uh, infamous TM right on the front here of the shirt. Uh, if you'd like to support what I do, I definitely have all kinds of different designs for Suzuki, Yamaha, Kawasaki, KTM. Even have a Husqvarna or two in there. Uh, and you can find the link in the description below and also I'll put a card here in the video. So here, without further ado, is the history of Suzuki's Open Class Machines from 1971 through 1985. The Suzuki Open Class Motocross story starts here in 1971 with the introduction of one of the most anticipated motorcycles of the 1970s, the TM400 Cyclone. Now, most of you out there probably will realize the Cyclone has gone down as one of the most vicious machines in motocross history. It really is uh, almost like a uh, black widow of motocross at this point. But uh, coming into 1971, that was certainly not the feeling most people had about this bike. If you read the press at the time, there was a huge amount of anticipation about this machine. This TM400 Cyclone was actually not Suzuki's first production motocrosser. In uh, 1968, they had offered a uh, TM250, which was based off of their works machine they were racing in the Grand Prix at the time. Suzuki was the first manufacturer really to get involved with motocross from Japan. And this uh, first version of the TM was based very closely on their works bike, which unfortunately was not a very good machine. Uh, they still were trying to get the bugs worked out early on, and the, the first TM was very limited production and uh, very limited in its success on the track. Uh, now, by 1971, however, Suzuki was really dominating the GPs. They had Joel Robert in the 250 class and Roger DeCoster in the 500s, and the RH and RN works bikes were really the bikes to beat. They were incredibly trick, incredibly light, uh, really awesome machines, and basically the pure uh, unobtainium of its day. They were the best motorcycles in their class. And in 1971, Suzuki introduced a production version of what they said was like a works replica machine, this first TM. The uh, TM was a machine that came in just under $1,000 at uh, $999. It employed a 396cc two-stroke single, 
uh, used oil injection, which is interesting. Of course, a modern uh, motocross machine would not do that, but uh, this TM was oil injected. So you didn't have to mix the oil if you didn't want to. Uh, the machine clocked in at a very hefty 248 pounds, uh, which if you think about that is actually more than pretty much any four-stroke you would find today. And that was one of the main problems with the bike. There were a lot of issues, though. This TM certainly had no lack of power. The the two-stroke uh, was a monstrously powerful engine for its time. And it came on, though, with a very sudden light switch style of power. It had a light flywheel. There was also some problems with the early electronic ignitions. This, this the TM used a very advanced for its time electronic ignition. And uh, while that was certainly... Uh, much preferable to points and what have you. It it tend to uh, offer erratic performance. Sometimes it would advance at the wrong time and give you a strange and erratic power delivery. The bike was notorious for its on-off power, and that made things even harder for the chassis, which was also a mild steel, uh, which was not up to the power the machine made. Basically, it had way more power than the chassis could handle. Uh, it was notorious for essentially... Uh, binding up like a spring and then releasing that energy and causing the bike to kind of go off in its own direction unexpectedly. A uh, great deal of the problem with that too is the suspension on this bike. Uh, the shocks were just not up to the weight and power the machine made and they were notorious for just being overmaxed and fading quickly. Uh, the forks were a little bit better. Of course in 1971 none of the suspension would be phenomenal by modern standards. As to horsepower, Suzuki claimed 40 horsepower at 6500 RPMs which uh, obviously, by modern standards, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but in 1971, that was a ridiculous amount of horsepower from a uh, two-stroke motocross machine. Uh, the machine, though, really, it was mostly not the power output, it was the way the power came on that was the real problem for the TM. This TM certainly is a beautiful-looking machine. This 1971 version is in orange, which is interesting because... Uh, obviously, the works bikes were yellow, um, so I'm not sure why this first year is orange, but it's a good-looking motorcycle. The bike certainly had the looks of the works bike. It, it looked actually a fair amount other than the color, quite a bit like Roger DeCoster's works machine, but the two bikes had nothing in common. You know, DeCoster's works bike is probably 60 pounds lighter than this, uh, which is just an astronomical amount. Um, his frame is much stronger. It's all got all these tie, titanium components on it. And this production TM really was built to, a, you know, a price point, I think. They went with fairly low-grade materials in most of the equipment, and the suspension certainly is pretty poor, even by 1971 standards. So uh, this bike, while it got a great deal of press early on, there's lots of tests of it in 1971, uh, most people thought the performance, you know, left a lot to be desired. But it was, I think even then, they thought it was a good value, but... Uh, quickly, the aftermarket uh, made a lot of components here to address most of the issues. Coney shocks were a very popular upgrade to get rid of the uh, dismal stock performance. And believe it or not, people actually went all the way to uh, putting on aftermarket frames on these TMs. Uh, the stock frame, as I said, is very flexy, uh, really could not handle the sudden strong power the motor put out. And uh, upgrading the frame to a much tougher aftermarket unit was a common upgrade uh, by obviously today that would seem insane. You'd take a bike and put a completely different frame on it. But back then, uh, some of these bikes were pretty uh, fixer uppers. So if you did get a TM and you wanted it to try and uh, not put you under the snow fence, uh, the the best upgrade was to replace the frame and upgrade the suspension and probably put a heavier flywheel on it. Because too, as I said, the that delivery was pretty sudden and uh, putting a heavier flywheel on it did. Uh, make the bike quite uh, easier to manage. Uh, I think there wasn't a whole lot of competition from Japan at this point, uh, so the TM really had the feel to itself, certainly at the price point it was. Uh, it was a very, very beautiful motorcycle and certainly a machine that had a lot of people excited in 1971, but its performance uh, left quite a bit to be desired on the track. For 1972, the TM400 Cyclone was back with only a cosmetic update. Uh, in spite of the fact that its performance was slightly uh, lackluster on the track, it certainly sold in quite a few numbers in 1971. Again, the price point just under $1,000 was really a bargain. Um, although if you added up the stuff you probably would have to spend to make it work as well as a Mako, uh, maybe it didn't seem like such a bargain. But um, in any case, uh, for 72, the TM is back with a switch to the yellow. Um, this is the color that's more in line with their works racers. Again, I'm not sure why they went with orange in uh, 1971. Maybe that was 
maybe more in line with some of the other street bikes they had. I'm not sure, but in any case, this is a more traditional Suzuki look, certainly the look that they continue with even to this day with the yellow, and this is the first year that they went to that color on the TM line. Uh, it remains the same machine it was the year before, still had that really potent uh, engine that was uh, definitely a machine to put hair on your chest. At this point, Suzuki really is the only game in town as far as the Japanese. Honda not released the Elsinore yet. Uh, most of Kawasaki's offerings were uh, pretty lackluster as well, certainly not as serious as the TM. And Yamaha did not have the YZ out yet either. Yeah, the uh, basically converted DT racers at this time, like enduro bikes with uh, kits on it. So while this is not a great machine, certainly by any means, and infamously bad, in fact, um, as far as you're looking at Japanese entries, uh, this is by far the most serious for, uh, entry by any of the Japanese at this point. So uh, the TM, while again, it's gone down as quite a uh, sketchy machine in terms of its performance, uh, Suzuki was certainly at the front of the pack in terms of getting ahead of the motocross curve and really the first manufacturer of the Japanese to kind of take it seriously uh, on, in terms, certainly at the GP level and, and the production side as well. So while the TM does get a pretty bad rap for its performance, uh, you do have to admire the fact that Suzuki was, uh, you know, taking the motocross market more seriously than its rivals at the time. For 1973, we get some pretty significant updates on the TM400. Uh, the 400K Cyclone has all new plastic this year. You can see the tank is a new design. It's a little slimmer, trimmer overall. Uh, you get an integrated side panel now design, a new air box with a foam style filter. Uh, earlier TMs had used a paper style filter, which obviously wasn't ideal if you got into a condition where there's going to be some water on the track. Uh, this <laughs> paper filters don't work very well when they get wet. Uh, so this is a much better idea on an off-road design motorcycle. Uh, you get changes to the frame, the suspension this year. Uh, suspension is still pretty lackluster on these bikes, particularly the shocks. Uh, but they did try to tweak them a little bit to have it uh, work a little bit better. Uh, there's not a whole lot of change to the motor. I think they tweaked the clutch mechanism slightly this year to work a little easier, but uh, no major updates as far as I know of on the engine this year. Uh, the graphics have a little different look. They ha you have a sticker instead of a badge on the tank. Uh, it has kind of a cool look that wraps around the tank this year with the TM at the base of the tank. I do kind of like the looks. The bike's still a good-looking motorcycle. I think all these TMs, particularly for their time, are good-looking motorcycles. But uh, the 73 model is really the first major uh, change. And I, I guess major is maybe a stretch. But they did make some tweaks to it to try and get the bike to handle a little better, uh, be a little less nasty on the track. Uh, they also changed the foot pegs this year to a new steel cast type uh, with a folding function, which was obviously very advantageous if you actually uh, caught your leg funny uh, with the folding-type lever. It would be less likely to break your ankle or your lower leg. Uh, so it's definitely pretty nice. Still not uh, very aggressive by modern standards. If you look at these pegs, they're pretty pretty sketchy. I'm sure if you're in the mud, they weren't very, very good at that point. But um, for 1973, it was uh, fairly state-of-the-art, I think, at the time. Uh, the bike is still very reasonable, and there's just no com competition really for it in terms of the Japanese yet. Although very quickly, uh, that would change. For 74, we get some more fairly modest updates on the TM400 for the 400L model. Uh, you have a change in graphics. Now the graphics kind of wrap around the tank uh, in an interesting way. Uh, the overall plastic is the same as 1973. Uh, it's still a good-looking motorcycle, in my opinion, uh, for the time. We do get a new head this year. They changed the fin design and also lowered the compression slightly, hopefully to make the bike a little easier to manage. Uh, they also changed the uh, sprocket cover to be a work-style cover, which had three holes instead of uh, two slots. Uh, to allow mud to get out easier. Uh, the motor still uses the oil injection, still the same basic size and the pointless electronic ignition Suzuki had been using since the original TM. For 1974, you also get the option of a new silencer to go on the end of the exhaust pipe. If you look at the earlier ones, there's basically just like a little stinger there, which certainly uh, didn't do a lot to quiet the motorcycle down. Uh, I'm not sure if this was a big push at this point because uh, around the same year, a Honda started adding an optional large muffler you could put on the Elsinores as well. So maybe people are complaining about how loud these bikes were, but uh, I'm sure not many of these made it to the motocross track, but you could uh, certainly tack this thing on uh, to the end of your uh, TM and make it a little quieter uh, for 1974. Uh, you also get a change to the suspension, although none of the literature I could find really described exactly what they changed in any great detail. They did say they made some improvements to the suspension here for 1974. Uh, they were trying to, 
obviously improve what was a pretty poor uh, performance by these earlier machines. It looks to have a little more travel in the front, although, I, again, it's hard to get really detailed information. A lot of these articles and stuff just kind of tell you what type of suspension is on the bike. Uh, they don't always get into the exact details of what they changed year over year, although, uh, again, to look at it, it looks like it's got a little more travel. Um, this 74 model, very similar to the uh, 73 in most ways, though. The, again, the tweaks were pretty minor. I was looking at the test at the time, and again, it was considered, you know, a pretty fair novice bike, uh, as long as you weren't looking to race it. it. If you tried to race it on a track in stock condition, it really was a handful. It wasn't very competitive, uh, particularly in comparison to the new YZ360, which was uh, really a much, much more serious motorcycle. Certainly way more expensive, but the performance was a quantum leap ahead of the TMs. This is the era where really... They're getting away from, you know, converted trail bikes or uh, kind of trying to make a multi-use motorcycle into, you know, kind of serious motocross purpose-built machines. And the TM really has its roots in uh, more kind of almost like a dual sport motorcycle. And uh, new machines like the YZ and the coming CRs uh, really were much more serious than these TMs were, at least initially. And it's just kind of coming to the end of the road in terms of this type of motorcycle for motocross use. Uh, with Yamaha getting more serious and uh, Kawasaki kind of coming online with their new KX series, uh, the competition was certainly heating up for uh, the motocross division from Japan. For 1975, we get the last of the TM400 Cyclones, uh, the end of an era of infamy uh, for Suzuki fans, I'm sure. Uh, this is a good-looking motorcycle, in my opinion. This is the year they went to the Rising Sun graphics on the tank. Uh, but the writing was on the wall here. The RM series was already out in terms of the RM125 here in 75. And in 76, of course, you get the RM250 and the RM370. So this is the last year of the infamous TMs. Uh, this motorcycle did get some suspension upgrades for 75 uh, in spite of the fact that it's on its way out. You get an all-new suspension in the form of a new rear shock system, which is move the mounting points forward slightly. Uh, it's putting out close to 7 inches of travel in the back, which is pretty good for its time. Uh, you have an all-new swing arm to accommodate that. Uh, other than that, though, the bike does handle better. It's still saddled with the same light switch power band, although uh, these later models do behave a little better. Uh, the ignition problems were sorted out quite a bit. Like I said, the early ignitions had some uh, issues with very erratic performance. So if you're going to get a TM, obviously the 75 is the one to get. It has better handling, the motor's a little mellower, the lower compression engine, and the uh, changes to the ignition certainly helped quite a bit. Uh, still not a great motorcycle, still way overweight. Um, certainly, you know, probably 30 pounds heavier than it needed to be to compete with some of the best open class machines at the time. Uh, but uh, help was on the way in the form of the new RM series very shortly. Uh, I will say again, good looking motorcycle. I do like this. Of all these TMs, I like the Rising Sun graphic. I always thought that was a cool look. You also get the yellow side plate uh, number panels here, which I always thought was an awesome look on open class bikes. And this is the one and only year where they did that on the TMs. Uh, so pretty fitting uh, into the line here for the mighty TM400 Cyclone. For 1976, we get an all new machine the RM370. And this is really where Suzuki's 70s motocross dominance starts here in 1976. This is really the first Suzuki production bike that deserves to wear the works replica name. Uh, the early TMs, they branded them as a works replica in the ads, but they clearly weren't works replicas in any significant way. They weighed 50 or 60 pounds more than the bikes they were uh, supposedly emulating, had you know low quality frames, poor suspension, uh, just weren't great motorcycles for the most part. This new RM370, though, is a no-compromise racer. It is built from the ground up to be a motocross racing machine. It has a much stronger chromoly steel frame. You have long travel suspension front and rear. Uh, Suzuki really kicked out the, uh, the angle of those shocks in the back to give the maximum amount of travel. They have what they call their new True Track uh, rear suspension system. Uh, which has like a kind of a triangulation of the frame, the shocks, and the swing arm. And uh, they worked really, really well. Uh, you have a new uh, bodywork, as you can see. Really great looking motorcycle, in my opinion. Uh, powerful new engines. This 370 has nothing in common with the old TM motor. It doesn't use oil injection. Uh, doesn't have any of the old like uh, trail bike routes in it. It is a no compromise racing motorcycle engine. 
This uses the new Suzuki power read design, which was a case read engine, which kind of combined sort of a straight up piston port engine and a read valve. There was a case read that fed fuel into the case below while also allowing uh, fuel to go straight into the cylinder. The idea was to give the motor a broader power band. Uh, you have really good looking bodywork. There's a new aluminum tank instead of a steel tank. The bike is significantly lighter at 235 pounds, which of course today would not be considered a super lightweight machine. Considering a modern electric start four-stroke ATM uh, probably has 15 pounds on it, uh, but it was significantly lighter than the old TM, certainly. Really a great, great motorcycle, and certainly much more of a, a competition for the YZ360. This is a quantum leap forward for Suzuki, and motocross in general. Honda at this point didn't have a 500-class uh, machine, uh, so it really is a two-horse game. The Kawasaki KX450, not nearly as competitive as this as well. Uh, so this is a great, great motorcycle and uh, certainly a awesome, awesome machine even today for vintage racing. After astounding everyone with its excellence in 1976, the RM370 was back for 1977 with a surprising amount of changes. The RM370B had some motor mods uh, that were all aimed at increasing the power of the engine and broadening its output. The Engine was the same born stroke as 1976, but they did change the porting. Uh, they lowered the intake three millimeters. Uh, they also modified the piston to be lighter and uh, changed the uh, locating pins on the piston to be more reliable. They also eliminated a bypass valve that was designed to ease starting that tended to get clogged anyway. Uh, didn't seem to, I guess, make enough difference to leave it in the motor. Um, they changed the exhaust porting as well. The motor offered a broader power band and a stronger overall delivery for 1977. Uh, in addition to the motor changes, uh, you have probably the biggest visual change between the two bikes, which is the all-new shocks in the back, which incorporate remote reservoirs. Uh, if you look at a 76 and a 77 back-to-back, -back, the only visual clue between the two is those remote reservoirs. They're pretty easy to spot here on the shocks. Those were, of course, done to increase oil capacity and aid uh, cooling to prevent fading of the shocks. Uh, the silencer was larger for 1977 as well, designed, of course, to make the bike a little quieter. Uh, in addition to uh, the new shocks, the swing arm was strengthened as well. This is one area where the original 76 model did show a bit of weakness. There were some issues with people cracking the swing arm. Uh, while the frame was very strong, the swing arm did have issues. So for 1977, they beefed up the swing arm as well. They also increased the diameter of the rear axle from 15 millimeters to 17 millimeters, also to increase durability. Up front, the Kiaba forks remained unchanged from 1976, but that was not a bad thing. The forks were already very well regarded in the open class. Uh, you also get some new brakes. Also for durability, they upgraded the quality of the rims for 1977 uh, to be a little more durable. Price for 1977 was set at $1,595, which was still a very, very competitive uh, price at this point. The bike was rated, according to Suzuki, at 40 horsepower, which is interestingly the same amount that the original TM400 was rated at in 1971. But of course, this power band is a thousand percent more effective, uh, smoother, more usable, um, definitely a broader overall power. It didn't have that light switch. The reed valve um, definitely helped in that regard. And the overall motor performance was very, very uh, well liked in the RM370. The 77 model was an excellent machine overall and one of the best open class bikes available in 1977. 1978 brings another year of major changes to the RM open class offering. Uh, this is the first year for the new RM400. Uh, you get an all new frame this year. You get a new motor which is very similar to the 1977 model but they up the bore. The stroke stays the same but they up the bore here and brought the machine up to a full 402 cc's. Uh, this was done, obviously, to broaden the power slightly. Yamaha had already gone to a 400 in 1977, so Suzuki was trying to keep pace by bumping up the displacement slightly. Uh, the motor, other than the uh, additional bore, was not greatly changed. It still used the original uh, semi-case read, power read, uh, basic layout. And they obviously had some changes to the exhaust for 1978 to accommodate the new porting and new cylinder. Uh, but the overall motor design was very similar to the year before. Uh, this new motor put out a very uh, torquey, mellow delivery. It was actually not particularly faster than the old model. Uh, it just had more torque down low. It was smoother, uh, more grunt out of turns, but uh, wasn't particularly faster overall. And it was noticeably slower than the YZ in this era. Uh, the Yamaha definitely had a little more uh, punch 
than the RM did, but most people like the mellow delivery of the bike. I, and I imagine if you're a pro, you might have wanted a little more, but most people thought it was an, a very easy and usable uh, power band here in the 1978 RM400. Uh, in addition to the new motor, again, you get a new chassis for 78. You get all new bodywork. Um, they had some problems with the earlier RMs, uh, front fenders breaking. I guess they get a little bit too much mud on them and they would crack. Uh, so for 78, you get a thicker, stronger uh, set of fenders with a rib in it to actually prevent uh, flex and uh, breaking of them when they're heavily uh, weighed down with mud. You also get a new bone saver front number plate, which was uh, taken from the works bikes. And what that has is two uh, flaps that reach up and over the handlebars to prevent the front uh, cable from catching on the bars and pulling the front brake by accident. Clearly, if this happened, that was not a good thing. If your forks returned and travel and grabbed a handful of front brake, you're going to go over the bars pretty spectacularly. And that was definitely an issue with some of these earlier uh, cable-operated brakes. Uh, so for 78, you get that standard, which was, I'm sure, a very appreciated at the time. You also get a new alloy swing arm. This is the first year where they went to aluminum on the swing arm on the RMs. Uh, probably, in my opinion, not quite as trick-looking as the Yamaha's uh, monoshock design, but uh, stiffer and stronger uh, and better than the old steel unit, certainly in terms of uh, strength and weight. You also get a new tank that does away with the aluminum design of the earlier RMs and goes to plastic this year. Now, I personally don't really care for the looks of this tank nearly as well as the um, the old 7677 design, but of course it's more durable. If you ever laid one of the old ones over, uh, it was easy to dent, and this new one is much more durable in terms of that. Although the uh, bleed through of fumes. Uh, through the plastic probably rendered the decals much less long live than the old design. Overall ergonomics were changed as well. The bike does sit up taller. There's a whole inch more travel front and rear to the suspension, which is uh, at this point suspension is growing leaps and bounds year over year pretty much. Uh, Yamaha had really been the first to kind of bring the long travel suspension with the original monoshock and then everybody else was quick to follow suit. Suzuki was doing it in a more traditional fashion with the dual shocks, but they were laying them down radically and uh, getting a little bit more travel year over year. So this year in 78, you get a full jump of an inch front and rear. So it's a pretty big difference uh, in terms of the overall size of the bike and the amount of suspension travel it had. One of the other complaints people had had with the original 370 was a chattering rear brake. It didn't uh, like, you know, stutter bumps, small little bumps going into turns. Uh, so for 78, you get an all new full floating rear brake which uses an arm running from the brake to the frame to isolate the rear brake from the suspension action. Gives it a little bit uh, better ability to follow the terrain under braking. So that's one of the nice things that Works Bikes had, and uh, they added that to the RM for 1978. In terms of overall performance, I think most people really like this bike. It seems from reading the test of the time that it was not quite as fast as the Yamaha, but handled better. The suspension action was very good. Uh, this is kind of the formula the RM open class bikes would use in the late 70s and early 80s. They were mellower than some of their competition, uh, but easier to ride. Very pleasant machines, handle well, good suspension. Really was kind of the formula Suzuki was using to uh, do so well in shootouts and on the track at the time. This is a good motorcycle overall, while perhaps not as iconic in terms of appearance as the original uh, 76 and 77. It's a better motorcycle, certainly on the track overall. For 1979, we get another all-new RM. At this point in motocross, bikes were changing hugely year to year, and it wasn't uh, very shocking, actually, to see a complete redesign from one year to another. Certainly, uh, the budget seems to have been uh, more uh, generous back then. They were selling a lot of off-road bikes in the 70s, and they figured, I guess, the technology was moving so fast, you had to do major revisions every year to keep up. For 79, you get a bump-up in displacement to... Uh, 417 cc's and this was done by actually giving a longer stroke this year so it maintained the same bore which they had increased in 78 as the year before but they added to the stroke this year to give it a little bit more of a, a longer stroke design give it a little even more torquey delivery uh, you have an all new frame once again uh, major revisions to the suspension. The suspension is once again much taller and longer for 79. You get almost two inches more uh, travel up front and a little more than two inches more travel in the rear. So that's a tremendous difference. 
uh, if you think about now, suspension travel really hasn't changed much since about 1980. And uh, this year in the late 70s, man, it's, it's growing year over year. Now, this was giving some people at the time trouble because the bikes, you know, were becoming much taller. Uh, if you get on a, like a TM400, uh, it's a pretty low machine. Uh, by 1979 here, these things are skyscrapers by comparison. And some people did not really care for the change, but it was hard to argue with the additional travel and what it could do as far as uh, the bike's ability to absorb rough terrain and jumps and what have you. Uh, this RM is another excellent motorcycle. The suspension this year was very well regarded. The motor is, again, a mellow, torquey engine. As I said, these open-class RMs, none of them were just power monger rockets. They were uh, allowing some of the other competitors to go that route. Suzuki was always going for a quality of power more than an overabundance of it. Um, the price this year jumped up to $18.99, which was $200 more than the year before, which is a lot of money, a big difference in 1979 year over year, uh, but you get a lot of stuff uh, for that money. You get an all-new swing arm, which is much trickier looking than the year before. Uh, the 78 model, while aluminum, a lot of people thought it was pretty cobby looking, and this uh, 79 looks like a works bike unit. It's pretty cool overall. You have all-new bodywork this year, and that's a little more controversial, at least in the fender design. Uh, the very early models had the, a little uh, duckbill lip on the front and rear fender, uh, which met with very uh, mixed reviews, I would say, in the press. Most people thought it was pretty hideous. So later models got a more traditional front fender, but they kept the weird duck bill in the back. Um, I'm not sure this is a one-year design. Uh, somebody at Suzuki thought it was a good idea. I always thought it just looked ridiculous to me, but it does give this 79 model a very unique appearance that uh, some people like and some people like myself strongly dislike. Uh, this is also the first year you get the FIM mandated uh, side panels that uh, go back a little farther. Uh, th this at the time I thought was a very cool addition. Um, you know, iconically, I think actually the, the shorter ones from earlier on look better now to my eye, but uh, back in 79, this made the bike look more modern. The uh, GPs were requiring uh, the machines to have the side panels a little bit easier to read for scores, so they're moving the plates backwards. You'll see some manufacturers like KTM were moving the plate all the way to the back fender, which I was not a fan of, uh, but this uh, the RM idea was just to move it back, and it gave you a little uh, more of a, a quote-unquote modern look to it. Um, you have a little slight reshaping of the tank this year. It's still plastic in the overall design, uh, but and very similar to the year before, but it's a little, little more sleek, I think. Um, I had a, a 125 this year, although I I was young and it uh, I didn't get ever get it running. It was a buddy of mine gave it to me and I couldn't figure out how to get it running. But I always thought the bike looked cool, uh, good looking motorcycle, and a very competitive machine. Yet once again for 1979. For 1980, the RM400 was back with basically just cosmetic changes. This is the last year for the dual shock design before they went to the very very well regarded full floater in 1981. This is a great motorcycle and actually a very popular uh, vintage racer to this day. Now, the overall design, as I said, is basically the same. They did get rid of the goofy fender in the back, so I guess I wasn't alone on that. The front and rear fender are different for 1980, and in my opinion, makes it one of the best-looking bikes of its era. It's a great-looking motorcycle. The fenders were basically the one thing that were kind of holding back the appearance, in my opinion. But uh, for 1980, they ditched that, and the bike is much better uh, for the d change. Uh, the bike itself is, interestingly, still very mellow. But uh, Dirt Bike found that there was actually an inner baffle in the stock pipe in this generation. And if you went with an aftermarket pipe, or actually if you just removed the baffle, uh, you got much uh, stronger performance out of the motorcycle. Basically very similar to what they did with the RMX a few years later. I don't know whether Suzuki was intentionally trying to tone these things down. Uh, they did the same thing on their PEs as well. Uh, some of the uh, PEs in this era had inner baffles in the pipe that really choked the motor off. And if you remove those baffles, uh, it made a big difference in terms of the performance. Maybe it was a sound issue. I'm not sure what the reasoning was there, but it really seemed to kind of detune the power band. So in stock condition, the bike is very mellow, particularly for an open class bike, way less powerful than a YZ465 or the Makos of the time. Uh, great kind of a beginner, uh, you know, manageable open class bike. I think actually if they'd kept these bikes mellow, the open class bike would have continued to thrive for many years to come. But in the 80s, the displacement kept going up and up and the horsepower kept going up and up. And these bikes quickly got out of hand to the point where most people weren't real interested in riding them anymore. Uh, it's like they all just kind of got crazy on horsepower figures and uh, left the consumer behind. But uh, this 1980 model is certainly not that way. It's very easy to control, uh, very fun to ride motorcycle, great suspension, excellent handling. Uh, really not uh, a whole lot to complain about other than the overall 
max horsepower figures. Uh, Dirt Bike says if you open the pipe up, it makes a huge difference in performance. Uh, depending on your skill level, that may or may not have been a, a good thing. But uh, as I said, this is the end of the line for the Dual Shock design and uh, a very, very well regarded motorcycle overall. Big, big, big changes on tap here for 1981 with the introduction of the RM465X. Now this year is the first year for the new single shock full floater rear suspension system. Basically, uh, the revolutionary suspension that kind of drove everybody to go with linkage suspensions. Kawasaki actually beat them to the punch by one year with a uni track. But that first version of the uni track did not use a rising rate linkage due to some patent concerns, apparently. Uh, and Suzuki actually probably had the same issue here. This first version of the uh, full floater was used through 1985. And uh, they actually, Suzuki stole this design from somebody. <laughs> and in reality, they were shown this uh, prototype design and basically copped it without paying the guy. He ends up suing the manufacturer and eventually Suzuki retired it. But uh, there were a lot of reasons for that. I think they would have went away from it anyway just because of the complexity and the um, basically weight and size of it. It made... Uh, then make a lot of compromises in terms of the airbox. The original full floater is a very large design that has these big linkage and strut arms that um, are very tall and large and take up a lot of space on the motorcycle right in an area where you want to get air into the motor behind the carburetor. So Suzuki had to come up with a unique dual airbox design on these that complicated maintenance and also made it difficult to get uh, the right amount of air into these motorcycles. Uh, this engine is all new for 1981. It went from a 417 cc to a full 464 cc. This is also the first year where they went away from the original uh, semi case reed design to the new full uh, reed design that goes into a cylinder in a traditional way. So there's no case reed on this 465. Still air cooled, of course. Uh, at this point, you know, liquid cooling had not come to the open class. Uh, all the uh, big boards were all air cooled in 1981, so that wasn't a major disadvantage. Uh, you get all new bodywork this year. Uh, you have a, it's a very good looking motorcycle overall. I think uh, the styling is not a whole lot different than 1980. Uh, the main difference being the all new rear suspension system is the main thing. You have a huge muffler on the back of this thing. It's a seriously large muffler. They definitely were concerned about keeping the motor quiet, it seems. Uh, the, in terms of overall performance, you also have a new fork this year. Uh, you have a 43 millimeter fork, which is interesting in that that was considered like the largest you'd see on any motorcycle at the time. That was the, the new large fork. And it was only on the 465, the 250, and the 125 didn't get the larger fork this year. Usually the 250 would get the same stuff the 500 would have got. Uh, so it's interesting that they uh, had to make do with a smaller fork as well in 1981. Uh, the fork performance is really the weak link on this motorcycle. Uh, the new 43 millimeter fork is actually the same amount of travels they had had the previous couple of years. It's putting out 11.2, which was considered pretty small at the time, and uh, way less than the 12.7 inches the new full floater was delivering in the rear. Uh, the motor was mellow. Uh, there were some jetting issues. I think most of them uh, were traced back to that airbox, which had a difficult time getting uh, the proper amount of air into the motor. Uh, they had uh, several kits that would open it up, different uh, airbox designs that let a lot more air in, and a lot of people recommended going with like a twin air or some aftermarket filter. That seemed to make the jetting a lot easier to uh, get sorted out with getting enough air into the engine and probably boosted the power as well. You also had a problem this year where uh, the bike did not come standard with an idle circuit, which is kind of strange. Uh, there was no way to adjust the idle, so if you had the bike in stock condition, the jetting was pretty erratic, and the bike tended to stall a lot out of turns, uh, which I'm sure was very aggravating, particularly on an open bike, uh, which your RPMs are going to be lower anyway. Uh, so White Brothers actually sold a kit this year where you could tap, uh, tap into the carburetor and add an idle circuit to it with an adjustable screw, and that certainly... Uh, probably made living with the arm a lot easier. I think once you got the forks dialed in, uh, modified the airbox, and added the idle system, uh, this was a very, very, very good motorcycle. It was never going to be as powerful as like a Mako at the time or even Yamaha's YZ465. These RMX um, models are uh, more mellow. The power band is kind of, even with the added displacement, still not an arm jerking, scary motorcycle to ride. Certainly way more easy to control than like the CR450 was this year. 
that made it a great open class bike for somebody who's looking for rideability over outright power. And this was kind of the great thing about these RMs. Uh, they were real easy to ride for an open class bike. And I think depending on what you're looking for, obviously, if you wanted the, the hairy chested uh, craziest motorcycle to ride, you probably would have wanted a YZ465. Uh, if you're looking for the best motorcycle in the class, it was probably the Mako still at this point. This is really the end of the line for the European domination of motocross. And the 500s are really the last class they were able to kind of hold on to that. And uh, Husqvarna's and Mako's and what have you in this year are very competitive machines uh, versus the Japanese. But uh, Suzuki was going for a little different flavor this year. And if you're looking for suspension performance, certainly in the rear, they had the competition cover. The full floater's performance was awesome, uh, just groundbreakingly better than anything else available that had come before or available in 1981. And that was kind of the main reason you went for it. Uh, the suspension forks. Not great. Rear suspension, great. Handling, you know, seems like it's pretty middle of the road. You know, people today now think of Suzuki's as being these incredible shredding bikes, but that really didn't start until 1989. Uh, these early 80s RMs were decent handlers, but they're more middle of the road. They're not shredders by any means. Um, I think this is, again, is a iconic motorcycle. Uh, definitely a very collectible machine if, you know, if you're looking for a suspension uh, technology kind of high watermarks. That's definitely what happened here in 1981 with the introduction of the new full floater RMs. For 1982, the RM465 was back with a list of uh, fairly significant changes, some of them for the better, some of them for the worse, in my opinion. The bike gets a new front fender this year. It doesn't look a whole lot different to me, but uh, Suzuki claims it's different. Uh, the rest of the bodywork is unchanged from 1981. Uh, you get a new motor that has a four-speed gearbox. Now, in 81, you had a five-speed. Uh, for some reason, a lot of the manufacturers went to the four-speeds in these open-class bikes. I was never a big fan of this because uh, it really limits the basically usability of the motorcycle to motocross only. If you're going to actually ride the bike off-road, which a lot of guys who bought 500s did, uh, that really limits its uh, usability. Uh, they had the same problem with the original CR480 and uh, definitely the 492, the Yamaha 490. One of the big things that they changed later in its run was going to a 5-speed, and that made it a much more versatile bike. Uh, you know, open-class bikes, more than a 125 or 250 are going to be used for many different uses. That's kind of the reason people buy the big, powerful things that are good off-road. And going with a four-speed was a strange choice. But Suzuki was really obsessed with weight uh, in this year, in 1982, and they did a lot of stuff to lower the weight on all the RMs. And I, I imagine they dropped the transmission gear probably for that reason. Uh, it doesn't really make a ton of difference, but it definitely hurts the usability of the bike. It's not like an open-class bike didn't have the power to pull the wider gearing, but... Again, it definitely limits its appeal off-road. Uh, you also get, this year in 1982, uh, new forks with revised compression uh, damping inside the forks. You also get a revision to the shock this year. They upped the compression damping on the shock. Uh, not that it really needed a whole lot of help. It was already an excellent performer. Uh, they lightened the exhaust pipe. The shape of the pipe is unchanged according to the specs, but the metal is made thinner this year to save weight. They got rid of the unloved carburetor from the 81 and went with an all-new flat slide design that they said would uh, be a little easier to jet and provide improved performance. Uh, they also changed the air filters. Again, this was a problem on the 81s, getting enough air into the motor, and they made some changes to try and improve that for 1982. Along with the significant mechanical changes for 82, you get a few uh, small but important changes added uh, in order to make the RM a little easier to live with. Uh, you finally get an update to the levers. Uh, the arms have been using basically the same lever since 1976. And for 82, you get an update to a dogleg style lever that's a little more comfortable to use. You get updated grips. You get a straight pull throttle, which is uh, obviously a little less likely to get caught on things. Uh, definitely an improvement here in 82. You also get a folding shift lever for the first time. Hallelujah. So if you dropped your RM, you weren't likely to bend the shift shaft or damage or break the shift lever. It actually had a folding tip, which was a major improvement. Uh, other than those small changes, there's just not a whole lot of difference here between 81 and 82. Uh, the motor is slightly uh, detuned. It has a little bit less compression uh, for 1982, and they uh, changed the height of the exhaust port slightly, again, to try and mellow the bike out. Uh, it's interesting to note that this is the point where the 500s really started kind of taking off in terms of power. You have the CR480 here in 1982, which is one of the powerhouses of the class. Uh, Yamaha was upping the size of their YZ to a 490. Um, of course, the Mako is still a really powerful motorcycle. You have KTM's uh, ridiculously powerful 495. And this is where kind of the 
trajectory of these 500 power bands is going straight up. And Suzuki's kind of doubling down on the mellow style of power. Uh, compared to the others, I was looking in the shootout here in 1982, and they kind of described the RM feeling like a powerful 250 compared to the, the big bore feel of some of the other 500s. Depending on your speed and your skill, maybe that was a good thing. Uh, again, I think limiting the uh, transmission to a four speed probably was hurting this because if the bike is a little easier to ride off road, more appealing in that realm, uh, you know, getting rid of a transmission gear probably wasn't the right move. But uh, overall, it's still a very good motorcycle. In the shootouts, it's ranked as by having by far the best rear suspension. But in every other category, it's kind of losing out to the competition. The new CR480 is much more powerful. Uh, it's basically the the engine everybody's you know trying to beat here in 1982. It's a phenomenal power band on that thing, and the RM is. Uh, much narrower. It's a kind of a mid-range only engine. Uh, they claim it's you know kind of feels like it has a light flywheel kind of zippy feeling, more like a 250. And uh, you know if you're looking for more of that the heavy vibe, big bore feel, it wasn't the way to go. The forks are improved. Uh, they were rated the second here in 1982, so they are better than the 81 forks. Uh, the bike itself handles decently. They complained about some head shake on it. I don't think the handling was the uh, you know the advantage that Suzuki's had in this year like they do with uh, bikes now. Uh, the bike was much more of a middle of the road handler, and like I said, some people complained about the head shake on this '82 model. Uh, the bike was again competitive. I mean, none of these 500s are slow by any means, uh, but if you're looking for the best motocross machine uh, in 1982, it definitely was not the best choice for that. The 82 uh, CR480 was probably a better motocross bike overall, in spite of the fact that the suspension was not nearly as good in the back as the RM. In off-road, they rated it way worse because of the four-speed transmission. So it's kind of a strange uh, choice that they made here in 82 that limited the appeal overall and didn't do a whole lot to really help the motocross side of it while hurting the appeal of it off-road. So I'm not sure what Suzuki was going for here, but uh, maybe not their best overall offering. In 1983, we get the move to the all-new RM500, which is really just a big bore RM465. They didn't really make any significant changes to the motor other than upping the bore size slightly, and the bike now displaces 492.1 cc's. The motor continues to be a four-speed transmission. Uh, the bike is uh, very heavy. If you look at the bike's weight, it was topping out at 250 pounds on uh, Dirt Rider scale, which is pretty hefty and right in line with the original TM400. Of course, this bike is significantly larger than the TM400, uh, double the travel, a lot more power, bigger engine, and everything else, but uh, it's pretty hefty. It really makes you appreciate just how light a modern four-stroke is. It just blows my mind that they're able to get such light bikes out of a um, something with electric start and everything that they have on them. But uh, this bike was hefty. It was the heaviest bike in the 500 class in 1983. You have a revision to the full floater this year. Uh, the frame is actually largely the same as the old 465, but they did add a new swing arm and revised the full floater linkage. Uh, they replaced the heavier steel struts with aluminum options for 1983. You also get an update to the uh, look of the bike with a new blue seat, which I quite like. They painted the 43 millimeter KYB forks yellow this year, kind of makes them stand out a little bit as well. Uh, overall travel is quite significant at 13.1 inches, which is, you know, at least as much as you would see on a modern bike. In some cases, probably even a little bit more. Uh, the front forks are putting out 10.6 inches of travel, which is actually less than most bikes were in 1983 and also today as well. Um, up front, you have a significant improvement here for 83. Maybe the best thing they did was they put a much better brake on the bike. In 1981 and 1982, the RMs had been notable for their lack of front braking power compared to their rivals. Uh, in 81, Yamaha and Honda both went to a dual leading shoe design, which basically allows the shoes to be pushed out towards the hub from both ends of them. So the top and the bottom simultaneously. Uh, a traditional drum brake is going to only push them out from one side or the other, so you get less contact, less force. It was a work style binder that made a big difference in terms of drum brakes. It was really the height of design for drum brake technology at the time, and it made a big difference in terms of the braking performance on the YZ and the CR versus this RM. For 83, they finally add the dual leading shoe brake to the RM500, but of course you have to do take note that Kawasaki at this point was actually already putting a disc brake on their bike. So technically Suzuki is still behind in the braking department, but it is much better. A uh, big powerful bike needs a big powerful brake, and for 83 the RM is much better, although still not as powerful as what you found on the Yamaha and the Honda, which were considered uh, some of the best brakes in the class at the time. Uh, this bike is, again, 
mellow compared to the other machines it's going up against. On uh, Kirker's Dyno, it came out about three horsepower lower than a YZ490. Uh, definitely a strong bike. You know, certainly it is still darn near 500, so it's not like these bikes are slow, but compared to its rivals, it was not uh, the powerhouse of the class. In 83, uh, the YZ490 or the CR480 were definitely uh, the motors to beat uh, in this class. But if you're looking for something a little more mellow, a little easier to control, uh, the RM500 was definitely competitive in that realm. It's not nearly as much of a disadvantage in the 500 class to have a bike that's a little slower and mellower than it is in a, like a 125. Um, none of these bikes are slow, so uh, maybe it actually made it a little better by the end of the moto. It wasn't wearing you out quite as much. Um, I've had a couple of the 83, 480s, CRs, and uh, they were a handful. That thing had a lot of power. Uh, so I think maybe having a bike that's a little easier to ride probably was actually an advantage. This bike is really the last major update the RM500 would see, the RM line. Uh, unfortunately, Suzuki was getting close to uh, pulling out of the open class. It's kind of interesting because the open class is still very prestigious at this point. In Europe, particularly, uh, the Grand Prix still kind of think of the 500s as like the Formula One class. It's still like the most prestigious one. But uh, for some reason, they were kind of losing interest in it. I imagine sales weren't great. And the fact that they didn't actually sell these bikes in Japan might have had something to do with it, too. I don't think they were ever as enamored with the open class in Japan because... Uh, they didn't sell them on the home market. These were for, you know, Europe and other markets where the 500s are more popular. So in any case, this was a significant update, uh, but it didn't really do a whole lot to make the bike more competitive in 1983. For 1984, the RM500 was back with the last update it would see, at least in the U.S. Uh, this year you get a blue frame, uh, which definitely updates the looks of the bike significantly, but the frame itself is unchanged largely from 1981. And that's one of the problems with this machine uh, in spite of the fact that they had made some, you know, pretty good improvements over the last few years, the bike basically looked like an 81. And in 1984, you got all new RM125 and RM250, and the RM500 did not get any of those updates, unfortunately. Uh, it's still using a drum brake in the front. Uh, the motor is still air-cooled, but that's not, as I said, a big detriment in 1984. None of the 500s were uh, liquid-cooled yet, but the motor is pretty mellow this year. They did make a few minor updates to the jetting and the porting of the motor to try and give it a little more uh, oomph, but it's still a narrow powerband, four-speed, 500-class machine that really uh, favors uh, more of the novice to you know intermediate rider more than the pro. It really wasn't a great pro machine. Uh, you do get a new fork this year. It's still a 43 millimeter conventional fork, non cartridge of course as well. Uh, they did add uh, a little over an inch more travel though, uh, which is obviously a welcome addition. Uh, the linkage and the uh, shock are updated slightly for 84 as well uh, to match the new front end. Other than that, the bike is basically exactly the same as it was the year before. Uh, the blue frame, as I said, does update the looks. You get a really ginormous RM500 on the seat, which clearly was designed for the other new seats on the 125 and 250. It looks kind of ridiculous on the 500. It doesn't really uh, fit the seat design very well. Uh, blue fork boots uh, are a good look as well. I like, I love the yellow and blue look. It's a good looking motorcycle, but it really does look like an 81 motorcycle and uh, very, very, very cobby looking compared to like the all new 84 CR500. Now, ironically though, uh, this RM was probably a better machine for most people. Certainly for somebody who wasn't a pro, the RM500 was a better bike than the new CR500, which was a major step back from the old 480 in a lot of ways. The new Honda made a lot of decisions that uh, turned some people off. It was really difficult to ride. The suspension wasn't great. And this uh, 500 in 1984 here has the best forks in the class, the best shock in the class, uh, handled pretty well. Just really the horsepower was the main disadvantage. And again, on a 500, maybe that may or may not be a big problem for you. If you weren't a pro rider, you were probably going to be very happy with this RM. Again, the, the main problem was probably the looks. It looked cobby. Uh, obviously, motocrosses are a vain lot, myself included. So having a bike that looks four years old is not a great idea. And <laughs> a sport where so many people uh, you know, go on curb appeal, it certainly looked way less advanced than the Neo CR500. Uh, the other problem, of course, was the brakes, too. This year, the Honda went to a disc in the front. And uh, motocross action basically described the RM as not even having brakes compared to the others. Uh, the YZ didn't have a disc yet, but the dual leading shoes on the Yamaha always worked better than this setup on the Suzuki, and the disc was way better on the Honda, so that definitely hurt it as well. Um, in any case, this is the last year for the RM500 in 1984 here in America. Uh, the bikes weren't selling particularly well, and clearly Suzuki wasn't you know, willing to put a lot of money into the machine. 
to update it to get the new linkage, the new frame, and the new bodywork of the 125 and 250. So uh, I guess they were seeing the writing on the wall here and decided to pull the plug in 1984. While we didn't get the RM500 here in the U.S. in 1985, and I usually stick mostly to the U.S. markets, I do want to mention they did build the RM500 in 1985 and sold it in other markets, uh, just not here in the U.S. And it actually had a fair amount of improvements this year, surprisingly so. Uh, they got an all-new fork this year in 1985, which I guess was probably, uh, they figured it was easier to stick the new 250 and 125 fork on the 500. Uh, so they get does get an update to the fork this year. You get a changing the color of the motor from black to silver, kind of getting it more in line with the, the smaller bikes. You also get uh, a subtle change to the graphics. It's not much of a difference. The bike basically looks the same. Uh, not a whole lot of other changes other than that. Uh, the bike did get an aluminum silencer the year before, 1984, uh, so that updated at that, and Freddy 5, of course, keeps the aluminum silencer. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of changes. I think they added a little rubber cover to the throttle. <laughs> little stuff like that, basically, was shared with the other smaller motors. Other than the fork, the main improvement, and maybe the most significant one, and one that the 84 model certainly could have used, was the new disc brake up front. Uh, the 85 RM500 here, in other markets at least, got the disc in the front, and that certainly was a big improvement on a machine that really needed all the stopping power it could get. Uh, so unfortunately, this 85 model is the last of the RM500s, period. Uh, really the last big bore Suzuki until 2005, when they would bring out the uh, RMZ450. So I guess it probably wasn't selling it like hotcakes in any other market either, and they decided they weren't going to put any more investment into it. And unfortunately, this is the end of the line for the mighty RM Open Class Two Strokes. So there you have it. That's a look back at the history of Suzuki's Open Class machines from 1971 through 1985. Suzuki was the first of the Japanese manufacturers to pull out of the 500 class. It's kind of disappointing, actually quite disappointing. Uh, the 500s clearly didn't, weren't selling as well as some of the smaller bikes, and, and I think as they got bigger and the motors got more difficult to ride, it uh, kind of hurt their sales potential. The RM certainly wasn't unique in that. It was a machine that probably uh, sold maybe half as many or maybe less than the 125. So I can understand the, the reasoning there. If you look at today, we all ride open class bikes. All these 450s are just uh, updated versions of these old 500 beasts. They're just a lot easier to ride. Modern fuel injection, of course, the four-stroke power makes them a little easier to live with. Modern suspension, too, makes it a little easier to handle the horsepower they have. But these bikes were just a little more unruly, and I just don't think they... Uh, once once they got bigger and bigger and then people started get gravitating toward the smaller bikes, it became harder for the manufacturers to justify putting that money into them. But if you consider Kawasaki kept making them till like, I think, 2003, Honda till 2001, you can see Suzuki really was um, kind of lame to pull out so early. They certainly could have come out with a more updated RM500 if they'd added liquid cooling and some other stuff. I'm sure they would have been competitive, but uh, they chose not to deal with it, not to spend the money on it. It's too bad. So the RM500 has had a real short run. Uh, the early on, the TMs were certainly infamous. If nothing else, it's certainly one of the most famous bikes, probably not for a good reason, but uh, people certainly know about them. So again, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out some of the other videos I've done. If you could like, comment, subscribe, share on social media, I would very much appreciate it. And until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.